Imagine yourself at 12 years old. Think of where you lived, who you lived with. Now, think about where you got your food from. The grocery store mostly, maybe a couple vegetables from the backyard. Chances are your story is not the same as everyone else's. Now picture that same 12 year old self in the middle of Des Moines, Iowa in the dead of winter. Your dad needs you to shoplift some frozen dinners for you and your five siblings. You know, the kids cuisine ones with the brownie mac and cheese and little penguin on the front of the box. At 12 years old, you've already learned to shoplift these frozen meals very easily, not because you wanted to, but because you needed to. You and your five siblings need, needed to survive. On the way home from the grocery store, which is across town from where you live, the only car your dad could afford breaks down. He decides you're going to run for miles in the freezing cold back to the Salvation Army, your current home. And running across town time and time again is the best thing your dad ever made you do. That's the childhood story of Lolo Jones, who would go on to become an all-American track and field athlete at Louisiana State University, which was arguably one of the best women's programs at the time. Jones also became an Olympic hurdler and bobsled competitor, and currently holds the national indoor record for the 60 meter indoor hurdles. She's one of the only athletes to have competed in both the winter and summer Olympic games. So what made her so talented? Well, there's a few things that all Olympians have in common, intense practice regimens, elite nutrition, and optimal sleep. And without knowing for sure, I'm guessing her genetic makeup favors the sprinting and power phenotype required to excel in world-class running in a sport where hundreds of a second can make a difference between winning and losing success requires the perfect combination of all assets but what about the rest of us for average athletes genes don't seem to play the huge role that testing companies might claim research suggests that the optimal genes for sprinting or endurance can only go so far when it comes to providing an advantage in a study of leg strength in males, those with the optimal combination of genes had more muscle strength and volume initially. But after the two groups went through a few weeks of identical training, those with the worst genes caught up. There were no longer any differences in leg strength, and any muscle gains were not related to their genotype. If Lolo Jones was able to overcome the adversity she faced in her childhood, she was probably able to overcome any genetic setbacks as well. But here's the catch. There are no elite female sprinters with non-sprinting genes at the elite level. The good news is though, that average athletes, such as in youth sports, can probably outperform their genetic destiny by training and testing. Our body is made up of three kinds of muscles that work with and against one another in order to coordinate all our bodily functions and movements. There's cardiac muscle, which causes our hearts to beat and pump blood throughout our body. There's smooth muscle, which is responsible for the background or involuntary muscle contractions we experience on a daily basis, such as digestion or the contraction of our pupils. And then there's skeletal muscle, which is the kind that most commonly comes to mind when people think of muscles. Skeletal muscle allows us to carry out all the voluntary movements that it takes to get us out of bed or walk up the stairs on a daily basis. When we walk, run, or jump, we are using our skeletal muscles to make that movement possible. In sprinting then, skeletal muscle obviously plays a very important role in how fast the sprinter moves. But if everyone has skeletal muscle, why are some pe people faster than others? It all comes down to a combination of genetics and environment. Skeletal muscle is made up of a ton of tiny muscle fibers that come in two forms, fast twitch and slow twitch. Fast twitch muscle fibers, as I'm sure you can guess, tend to contract faster and with more power, while slow twitch muscle fibers contract more slowly and with less power. Every single person has a different composition of these two muscle fiber types. Based on the information I've just given you alone, I'm sure it sounds like it would be better for a person to have a lot of fast twitch muscle fibers to make them as fast and as strong as possible. However, it is unfortunately more complicated than that. In order for muscles to contract, they need a source of energy. Fast and slow twitch muscle fibers get their energy from different sources, which places different limitations on them as a result. Slow twitch muscle fibers utilize oxygen to fuel their contraction. Using the air that we continuously breathe in and circulate through our blood, slow twitch muscle fibers can generate an energy molecule called ATP to contract repeatedly. 
This is called oxidative metabolism, since it uses oxygen to generate energy. And because oxygen is an abundant resource in the body which is constantly replenished, it can be sustained for a longer period of time. On the other hand, fast twitch muscle fibers use glucose, or sugar, to contract. This process, called glycolytic metabolism, also produces the energy molecule ATP, but by a different mechanism. Using sugar as a source, fast twitch muscle fibers can contract more quickly than slow twitch muscle fibers, but only for a very limited amount of time. Sugar is not constantly replenished in the way that oxygen is to the body, so fast twitch muscle fiber metabolism can only be sustained for a small amount of time. So, in summary, slow twitch fibers allow you to contract your muscles at a slower rate for a longer period of time, while fast twitch fibers contract at a faster rate for a shorter period of time. Again, these processes happen in everyone, but they happen in different proportions based on the varying compositions of fast and slow twitch muscle fibers. These compositions are primarily determined by genetics, although they can be affected by environmental factors such as exercise and training as well. One gene that plays a large role in the determination of fiber type composition is called the actinin-3 gene, which expresses a protein called alpha-actinin-3. The production of this protein is absolutely essential to the function of fast switch muscle fibers. Now, there is a common gene mutation among the population that can lead to this protein not being produced at all. The technical term for this mutation is the R577X polymorphism, which means that instead of the body making a complete product, a nonsense mutation causes protein production to stop early so that no functional protein is produced at all. Therefore, individuals who have this mutation have muscle fibers that behave more like slow twitch fibers than fast twitch fibers, regardless of their actual fiber type composition. Studies have shown that this is because of lack of actinin-3 protein in the muscle fibers of individuals who inherit both copies of the mutated allele, a genotype referred to as XX, constrains the use of glycogen, which is required in order for fast twitch muscle fibers to contract. It makes sense then that research has shown that individuals with the XX genotype perform better in endurance sports than in sports requiring speed, like sprinting. Like I mentioned before, however, genetics are not the only thing that determines how well an athlete performs. There is also the impact of the athlete's environment. Interestingly, there is a lot of evidence, some of which Michael introduced before, supporting the idea that environment plays such an important role in determining an athlete's performance that it has the potential to close gaps in performance caused by differences in genetics. For example, picture a sprinter who expresses both copies of the functional actin in 3 gene, the genotype we will call RR. Based on his genetics alone, he is very likely to have muscle fibers that overall behave more like fast twitch muscle fibers than slow twitch fibers. Therefore, in the absence of any athletic training, he would have an inferior lung function compared to an individual with the XX genotype because of his lower utilization of oxygen and higher utilization of glucose as an energy source. However, when we change the sprinter's environment by intensively training him in endurance, his lung function can improve so much over time that he will eventually have the same level of lung function as someone with the XX genotype. Earlier, Michael provided a similar example about leg strength and how athletes with different genotypes were also able to overcome performance gaps caused by genetic differences after strength training. So it would seem like some media outlets and even scientists are pushing the importance of genes in genetic testing and athletic performance, despite this data that instead supports the importance of traditional athletic traits like hard work and perseverance. Another important thing to note is, as Ali will show us, actinin 3 is not the only gene that has been found to be correlated with athletic performance. In fact, there is no one gene that has total autonomy over how an athlete performs, and genetics alone does not have autonomy either. In the past several years, many researchers have attempted to identify biological and genetic traits within humans that may correlate with elite athletic performance. There are three variations of, ACT, of the ACTN3 gene, XX, RX, and RR. The frequency of this genotype varies among ethnic groups. Approximately 11% of Ethiopians 3% of Jamaicans and U.S. African Americans and 1% of Kenyans and Nigerians possess the XX genotype, known to promote endurance in athletes. The RR genotype is favored in sprint and power athletes, and the RX genotype is a combination of athletic performance. The ACTN3 gene has a strong relationship with the R allele, which is correlated with speed and power in elite athletes. Additionally, evidence suggests that the, that the ACTN3 polymorphism is associated with the R allele it could, that could impact more than just speed. But a number of other traits, such as exercise recovery, injury risk, and training adaptation. The RR genotype is correlated with the greatest increase in strength and power. 
Thus, those carrying the R allele will respond best to speed and power strength training. The molecular mechanism of this idea is P70S6K phosphorylation, which is greater in the R allele carriers than the XX genotype carriers following sprinting exercise. This is because of mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin, and P70S6K regulate skeletal muscle hypertrophy, supporting the idea that power improvements are created in R allele carriers following resistance training. Testosterone levels are also higher in males carrying R alleles in competition with those carrying the XX genotype. This may provide evidence as to why R alleles favor strength in athletic prescriptions. Possession of the R allele genotype is also correlated with enhanced response to resistance training, reduced post-exercise muscle damage following eccentric training, and reduced overall injury risk. However, it is asserted that the XX genotype can lead to reduced response and resist reduced response to resistance training, increasing post-exercise muscle damage following eccentric training, and increased injury risk. Other genes may also affect a sprint ability in athletes. The polymorphism of the angiotensin I converting enzyme impacts human physical performance. The ACE insertion and deletion is associated with either endurance or sprint performance similar to the ACTN3 gene. The possession of the I allele is associated with endurance, while the D allele is associated with strength and power performance, particularly in elite swimmers. Other known polymorphisms affecting athletic performance are the brady kinnan 2 gene influencing skeletal muscle strength. Different methods have been used to obtain data. In one study, participants endured a 12-week long, high-speed power training program. This study included 139 older women, women that were older than 65 and a half years old. It was found that those having RR genotypes had greater performance improvements in comparison with those females carrying the X allele. But what about elite or trained athletes? People inheriting two X alleles do not make accident at all. Just 5% of male Olympian sprinters have two copies of the X allele. Well, no female elite sprinters carry two copies of the X genotype. However, in Olympian endurance runners, 24% had the XX genotype. Research behind the ACTN3 variations may lead to positive discrimination within the world of elite athletics. If genetic profile is found to be indicative of certain athletic success, certain athletes may be favored over others. This could make sports even more exclusive or genetically ex discriminative. Thus, as a society, we must determine if it is appropriate to judge athletic performance and potential by genotyping individuals. Although actin and 3 genotypes have been linked to sprint and endurance performance, this correlation is strongest considering elite level athletes and most likely doesn't have much significance when it's used to analyze more general populations, say, a college physiology class. In fact, our class data shows exactly the opposite of what we would have expected. We saw a decreased frequency of the RR allele in sprinters when compared to the more general population. As less than 1% of the population goes on to be an Olympic athlete, the chances are that for the vast majority of the world, your actin and 3 genotype won't have too much bearing on your athletic success. Like they say, hard work beats talent if talent doesn't work hard, and there is no scientific reason that someone with an RX or XX genotype can't compete in sprinting at the college level and go on to have a very successful and rewarding college sprinting career. While RR genotypes may have a slight advantage in sprinting, these individuals won't be able to get anywhere without training, and individuals with other genotypes will most likely be able to match their performance, assuming that they're training hard enough. This being said, genotyping can have very important applications and yield very valuable information. For example, Genetic testing can help individuals better understand their health and help them make better lifestyle choices, and even help them create training protocols that are best suited for their health. Knowing that you have a risk for a particular genetic disease, or even that a certain type of training would benefit you more than other types of training, 
is very different than using it for talent identification or for choosing a sport, decisions that should ideally be based on merit and passion respectively. Genetic testing can provide incredibly valuable insight and yield life-changing health benefits, but it can also easily be misused and abused. Children get involved with sports for a wide variety of reasons. Maybe you joined the soccer team because all your friends were playing soccer. Or maybe you joined the swim team because your parents wanted you to be water safe. Or maybe you even started sprinting by running across town like Lolo Jones. But whatever your story is, it shouldn't be because your genotype told you to. Genotyping children would send the message to the next generation that one's inherent genetic ability to perform a task is more important than their hard work and passion. This mentality could lead to a slippery slope, creating a society where decisions are ruled by genetics. If we support genetic testing being used for talent identification, where do we stop? If our athletic fields are divided by genotype, what about our classrooms? What about the workplace? Now, I'm not saying that implementing genetic testing to help people choose their sports would turn the U.S. into a real-life Gattaca, but any choice that reflects this mentality brings us one step closer. One step closer towards taking choices away from individuals and taking the fun out of sports. One step towards teaching children that their efforts do not matter because their destiny is already determined by their genes. While genetics can undoubtedly yield important information, in the case of using actin and 3 genotype to predict sprint performance, we are better off letting individuals choose their sports in order to create a society of individuals who are playing sports for the love of the game, not because of their genetics.